when Ken said, can you talk about the keys to a rewarding scientific career, I thought, oh, well, that's a big topic because there are lots of ways to structure your career and lots of definitions of rewarding scientific and career. And you're all probably sitting there thinking, oh my God, you know, and it only looks like you knew what you were doing when you're really at the end. So what does it look like when you're just starting out? I think it looks like the steps are really high and the pathway's very murky and you don't know where you're going. So you do sort of have to play this out in your brain in a couple of different ways. It's helpful to think about where you want to be going, even if that doesn't end up to be exactly what you do. And one of the things I always think about and, and have utilized in treatment is imagery. So imagining what you're going to do. The reason I have those two statuettes up there is those are fertility symbols. And what does fertility look like? Well, this is what fertility looked like to the Stone Age denizens that were making statuettes. So I went to a meeting in France and I saw this ad. And um, it was in a small town, quote unquote, nearby. There were probably 200 statuettes of prehistory of femininity. So it's dreams of women in prehistory. And, and they were all really different. So they're at the bottom as we go forward. But you can see that people have different ideas, different images of who they want to be, what they're going to be. And each one of you has your own image. And that's, that's the important piece of that, is that I don't know when these were made exactly. They start a long time ago. And they obviously were shorthand for something that people wanted to communicate. But that image captures more for us than any word would have ever done. So when you're thinking about where you're going to go, I kind of broke this into the cognitive pieces, the emotional pieces, and then what I think about are amplifiers, energetics. And then I think about external factors. So I use this to actually roast a good friend of mine at a scientific meeting. She's, very, uh, she's a bit of a queen in her own field. So I said, queens are made, not born. But you know that the queen bee has the same DNA as everybody else. It just gets epigenetically regulated. And one ends up a little different than all the others. So when you're thinking about where you want to go, you have to think about your internal factors. But you also have to think about your external factors and try to choose wisely, try to land on your feet. So I think of this as stages and a path. So one is to target something you really love. I think that matters a lot, that you love it. If you find yourself thinking about it in the shower, in a conversation with an important person, your mind wanders. If, in fact, you think about this more than you should, I think that's probably a good sign. Because then you will be authentically and genuinely attracted to this for a very long time. I'm still doing what the Giannini gave me money to do. I've changed it up a little bit, but it's not wholly different. And it should be something that matters to society and to medicine and industry or whoever you're going to be working for so that you can become an expert in authority, but also I think that you will be perceived as genuine. You don't want to be doing it just to do it as a job, because it really isn't. And I think all of us, maybe there's an exception to this, but I haven't met it, start small, accrue, evolve, add. But a good friend of mine, one of my early first jobs as an assistant professor said, try to focus so that at the end you can tell a story, your scientific story. So you have to prepare, and you are all well prepared, I am sure. I was trying to think, what would I tell somebody about the cognitive features that make you prepared? Well, actually, that's sort of the easy piece, right? That's the academic piece that we all engage in every day. But then there's some other factors. I think the emotional readiness is probably the hardest part to assess, even in yourself, but also in others. So who's going to stick with it? across the long term. There are some factors that probably regulate this, and I don't know all of them, but I made a list here. And one of them, I think, is learning to cope with adversity. I say that because it's just tough. And I don't know that it's tougher now than it ever was. It seems like it might be. 
is hard to make that pronouncement, but along the way you're going to have to have lots of emotional strategies for dealing with people. Now I study stress, and there's lots of definitions of stress, but my definition of stress is people. Um, because people are usually the biggest stressor people tell me about. Um, and sometimes they have sort of murderous instincts and they say that's the one strategy that you can't use for dealing with your stressors. But people have an amazing ability to stress each other. Um, and when you're doing team science, it can get kind of stressful. Even if everybody had enough money, it would still be stressful. So you have to sort of prepare yourself for that part. And then the energetics. So not only do you have to make opportunity, you have to take opportunity. And sometimes I see people turn down opportunity because it isn't quite what they wanted. And I think that's probably not always a smart thing to do. So some of the time it is. But some of the time opportunity comes to you in the kind of lateral vision. And you have to be able to think outside your narrow pathway. So we tell you to focus and stay linear and go that way. But every once in a while you're going to have to not do that. And you're going to have to be the one that, that carries the consequences for doing it. But I, I encourage it even if it actually feels foolhardy at the time. So what are your first steps going to look like? Anybody ever heard of Joseph Campbell? So he has the myth of the going out and conquering. And I think it's all about rehearsing in your mind where you're going. Now, it may not be where you go, but if you don't rehearse it, you will be unprepared. And you have to plan for the worst. You have to have like your worst case scenario that you imagine yourself dealing with and then I don't think it'll happen. But you will be prepared if it does. I saw this and I thought this was great. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go as a group. And think about your scientific camp, your scientific hope, and how much you are borrowing from everybody every day but also how much you are gaining from being as part of the group. And that's very difficult to do because a lot of our promotion sort of hurdles actually have to do with you. But I am always encouraging even every academic place I've ever been to look at the group, to kind of have some group metrics, to think about how the group is doing. Because that's very fundamental to the way we do science, and it's certainly the way we provide clinical care. We provide it as a team. So learning to be part of the team is very hard, and having days where you are not it, where you're not the lead dog, but you're actually helping someone else. So giving to get, I think, is a fundamental principle, but we don't actually encourage it all the time, but it's absolutely fundamental. So you have to Think about the team, align with your institution, avoid being marginalized because you're going to need resources and people are going to have to vote you on the island. And so staying in conversation about what the team needs is actually pretty fundamental. So you've prepared your mind, you're going to go out and conquer reality, but you can't go up that mountain alone and you're going to need friends. And that's when you have to learn to assess culture. We don't actually often talk about culture, so just coming on the Stanford campus this morning, I knew I wasn't where I normally am every morning. It looks really, really different. And I was trying to think, how would you describe the difference between Wake Forest and Stanford? Pretty different. If I took somebody who'd been at Stanford for 20 years and said, okay, here's your new home, this is Wake Forest, how long do you think it would take them to understand what Wake Forest has as a culture. A couple years, at least. And so when you're there trying to fit into a culture, you really have to have a different kind of antennae, a different kind of intuition for what's going on around you. So you have to pull your head out and look around and assess the situation that you're in. So I always think of having symbols that guide us and there are the symbols that are specific to the team that you're with. I think it must be that Stanford has red as a color. And what's the color for Wake Forest, anybody know? 
Yeah, see, black and gold. We, everything is black and gold. I didn't make black and gold slides on purpose. I said, I'm coming here as a more universal kind of symbol. So you think about your kind of branding, your local branding, but then we all want to reach out and have something that is bigger than our own little camp. And that sort of cultural universality, I think, are important. We want to have symbols that mean that we belong to science, that we belong to medicine. And what would those look like? I don't know. Everybody gets to decide. but. I think we want something that reinforces a sustainable mindset. So when I thought about Giannini, I thought of it as part of that uh, kind of collection, that pantheon of foundations that has allowed many of us to grow up. Now, it was my first step, but it was just so important that I couldn't have lived without it, is how it looks now. I don't know if I felt it was that important at the time, but as I look back, I know it wouldn't have been the same if I had not gotten that opportunity. So I was lucky, and luck is good. It's always good. But when I think about funny symbols, I ran across this when I was a kid. I ran across it in the desert of New Mexico. I ran across it again and when I was doing a little, I like, uh, you may have noticed, sort of prehistory. Um, so this is actually also a Minoan symbol. So isn't that weird that the Minoans and the Navajo and the Hopi would all have the same symbol? Where would that universality come from? Well, I will tell you that this is the shape of Mercury in the sky, witnessed from the Minoan civilization. I just happened to grow up as a kid on 2006B Mercury Drive that just happens to be at a nuclear air force base in the middle of nowhere in the desert of New Mexico. And my dad taught astrology, no, astronomy. <laughs> and I was uh, forced to learn it as a child. So when I picked this as a symbol many years later, I think it was probably not an accident because the Hopi were just seeing it at a different angle. And they came up with the same symbol of a labyrinth. And I thought that was a great symbol for our careers because in many ways we get stuck in the labyrinth of our era, of our time, of our culture, of the way we do science. But there's much more that's universal about science than just the era that we're in. And it's that kind of universality that I think we all seek, we all want, because we are part of a family of scientists that have existed forever. So when you're plotting your career, there's going to be weather, some really bad weather. Some years are really bad. And this is why you have to prepare for failure, because if you didn't ever fail, there's something wrong with you. I mean, how could that be that you will never have failure somewhere along the way? So you have to be ready for that. You can go to a place that looks perfect and they will do something called mission drift. Has anybody ever been to mission drift before? Mm, not fun. Get there and uh-oh, what we were gonna do, we're not gonna do anymore. Somebody's changed it up and the mission has drifted. It may have exploded, it may not be there at all, but mostly it just drifts kind of away from you and you can't quite get back to where you need to be. I always say pick a good family. I picked really good kids. They were very supportive and didn't need a lot. That was helpful. You got to pick a good tent. Ooh, that's hard. You know, not all tents are the same. They have to do pretty much the same thing, which is provide shelter and a foundation for you. So you've got to pick a tent and you've got to pick a campsite. And it's got to be some place that you're comfortable with. But then you have to have some base camp rules, right? So you've got to be able to get along in camp. And so here are some people. They might probably have some rules. And they have trust. They trust each other. And that's very, very important. So I thought of professionalism as really fundamental to what we need to have. Trust in each other to do our jobs, to be honest with each other, to be genuine. And those partnerships are what are going to sustain you across time because if you can't trust each other, if we're so hyper-competitive that we don't have colleagues, 
to be very lonely and, and not very good. So remember the group when we go along. So for me, I'm at dusk. Dusk is good. So when you're at dusk, what are you thinking about? Well, you want to stay active in your chosen field, whatever that turns out to be. For me, that is writ large now as sex differences and women's health, and I am passionate about that, and it's something I'm never going to stop thinking about. I wake up every day still the same. I have people coming from all around the world to spend time. So you want to be kind of a mentorship magnet and be able to do that. I'm still learning how to do that. That's hard work because when people come from foreign countries and don't speak English and I have to kind of weave them in, it's a challenge. So I'm trying to learn to be a very good coach. One of the things I read about in the Harvard Business Review was the difference between mentorship and sponsorship and learning to be a good sponsor. And that's different. So sponsorship is finding opportunity for the people that you are mentoring. And it's, it's a step up from mentoring, I think. Because our focus now is on the next generation. That's all I think about now. I really don't think about myself. I don't think about my career. I think about what can I give to the people in my department, in my institution, what do they need to succeed? What are the keys that they need? And which of those keys can I give to them that they'll be able to use? Because I want to end up with a legacy and an endowment. That's where I think again of the Giannini and all that they have done across many years to be a legacy for all of us. So important, very important. And I never ever got to say thank you enough, so this is my thanks because I know I wouldn't have ever been where I am today if I hadn't had a good place to start. And I have started an endowment for Wake Forest. My husband and I give money. And actually, other faculty are now giving money to what we call the Hope Fund. So we're all trying to live long enough to make our money do good things for us as we leave and to set a good example for you guys that are coming along. So it's been, thanks, Ken, an incredible thanks, Sarah. Um, an incredible honor to just say a few words about why I think it's important to, to, to sort of start out, stay optimistic, keep going, don't despair, follow your passion, and I think it will work out. I really do. Thanks so much. <laughs>